getting a seat table. While debates will differ from country to country, we hope these videos and Q&A sessions will provide a starting point for you know, human rights defenders all over the world to kickstart debates on cyber policies that support and promote human rights and security in a balanced manner. Um, this online training is open to all and will feed into the in-person training component of the overall cyber capacity building training program um, for which um, we, we ran um, applications for earlier this year. Um, this is focused on making cyber policy making processes around the world more inclusive by building your capacity and advocacy skills and fostering stronger collaboration in developing rights respecting cyber policies. Okay, and over to, <laughs> with that, um, our um, excellent uh, speakers today are Francisco Vera of Pancho, um, uh, who is an internet expert in cyber policy, um, Grace, who we're still waiting for, but I'm sure she'll be there in no time, um, Andrew Pudifat, um, who's um, chairman of the board at Global Partners Digital here. Um, and with, over to you, over to you, Francesco. Now. Please, there you go. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Francisco. Uh, you can tell me also. Uh, and uh, I part also, uh, I'm part of this effort as member of the advisory board of this initiative. Uh, we are here with Andrew and Aditi and and very soon with Grace. And uh, the objective of this webinar is like to address some questions or like uh, whatever comments you have on these videos on the initiative in order to uh, gain some post, uh, deeper into the content or adding some like a uh, more valuable information or having some interaction with our experts uh probably here the major expert is Andrew, so <laughs> we will have we will be hearing a lot of, from him and his experience and um we have already some questions to kick start the, the conversation so, uh, I mean, I really would like for this to be based on uh, the questions that you have. You can keep in those in the chat or um, maybe if, if you want to really speak out on the question, we can go uh, over that later. But for, for now, we will start with a question from uh, Mariama Dean. <laughs> Sorry, I just uh, put the name, but uh, did it, should we uh, use the names of the, uh, the person that, uh, that do the question? Um, I mean, everyone will be in um, anyway um, as well. So, um, if anybody has a problem who has submitted a, a question, please know if you'd rather remain anonymous and make sure you do. Yeah, I already thought, uh, I mean, uh, Mariama under the bus, so okay. Uh, there are different bodies, he says, institutions and organizations working in the space of cyber policy and security issues. Sorry if I don't narrate uh, my questions as well as the narrator of the videos. <laughs> she was following great. So, uh, some seem to be involved more in technical issues or in policy-related issues. To extent, are these organizations working together to promote security and ensure the rights of people are protected in the digital age? I think this question can be addressed from uh, many ways. Just to start, I, I will say that uh, uh, of these uh, bodies and institutions are engaged with both. I mean, trying to promote security and ensure the rights of people, but they tend to have different angles on uh, how to ensure rights of people. Especially because uh, speaking about ensuring rights of people can be interpreted as, like, for instance, uh, guarding against cybercrime is a way to also address uh, or ensure rights of people. And there is this strong narrative about uh, human rights, which is also at bottom, I mean, at the base of all these webinars and videos. Uh, so they do work on both, or they declare that they, they work on both, but there are angles and different uh, discourses on issues and for instance on terms of security they tend to understand security in different ways i mean you have some government for government forum and they understand security in some sort of a national security setup uh, you have some human rights i mean fora where they understand security as a way to ensure uh, personal security uh, human rights and sometimes the narratives can uh collide with each other so uh i don't Probably uh, Aditi or Andrew want to add something to this. I mean, we can start uh, go uh, back and forth with the, some comments, but 
uh, for a start, I would say that probably do declare that they work in promoting security and ensuring rights, but they do have sometimes different angles. And that's the importance of having some a, a, a personal or a proper narrative to fit in those uh, for us or venues and be able to influence them. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, if I, if I could add to that, the, the, the various bodies that deal with cybersecurity themselves don't coordinate that well. So the engineering bodies don't necessarily work with the normative or standard setting bodies or the specific treaty bodies. What you'll find is an overlap of institutions. So you'll find governments represented across all of those institutions. But one of the complications for us as advocates is that there are usually different bits of government that participate in different forums. So within the telecommunications forums like ITU, you may have the telecommunications regulator. Within normative bodies like the Internet Governance Forum, you have the Human Rights Department. Within the UN General Assembly, you'll have the permanent missions and diplomats. And when it, in some of the specialist cybersecurity agencies, you'll have national security, policing, home affairs departments. And that produces governments that take slightly different approaches across themselves. So they don't necessarily, so the national security people don't necessarily come at these issues with a human rights angle, even though there are human rights people within government would seek to do so, but they're simply not the representatives in those forums. So one of our jobs is to is to navigate between those different forums, understand that the messaging we have in terms of advocacy will be, need to be different depending on the types of public officials who are going to be present in each of those meetings. So we'll just use the same type of protein arguments in every single forum. We have to we have to adjust them depending on who it is we're likely to be dealing with. So I think the answer is there isn't the kind of coordination that we hope for and that would make our lives more easy. So it, it may be more complicated for us, but that's one of the things we have to negotiate, I think. Yeah, I think within that, that sometimes it's like wrong to assume that if you speak with one government officer from one agency, you are speaking with the whole government. Uh, that's the ideal, I mean, to have just one single point of this conversation or entry, but, but governments are just, are just as bureaucratic as this, uh, any other big organization. So sometimes you speak with the human rights guy and you get to uh, understand that they're really cool with some issue and they are, have a very progressive agenda and to find, for instance, the police uh, representative from that country and have quite different speeches. So unless you uh, get some like uh, understanding of what the different positions are even inside the government, probably, uh, you, uh, it's, it's difficult to be as effective if you are not aware of those differences. And yeah. that also happens even with companies. Sometimes you speak with a public relations guy, with a policy guy or the technical guy, and you can get also different uh, discourses on the issues. So that's very important to keep an eye. I don't know if Aditi or Grace want to add something. Basically, um, the only thing I would add is that um, this really feeds into sort of the next module of cybersecurity that we're going to go into of the shared definition, right? So if everyone is talking about security and rights kind of in, the, in, the, in different ways um, from different sectors, different angles, because as you say, they are all working on security and they will be thinking of different rights, particularly, you know, liberty, safety, that, that is a human right there um, in a different way. So. Um, part of this sort of lack of a shared narrative of what an uh, um, adequate rights-respecting kind of security policy will be something that is actually quite political and that needs to be shaped with um, human rights and perspectives within that. So that is why, you know, again, this series is aimed at um, getting people involved in the debate, even just understanding it, trying to get uh, some sort of shared vision of what that it should even look like, what those definitions should even be. Um, I think, you know, that's kind of a key question that none has really answered yet. Yeah, and also just uh, to wrap up, I mean, so you have some definitions in countries, but those definitions are not enforceable, are not like actually legal definitions, are mostly political definitions. So it's not very easy to use those definitions and demand government agencies to find, be binded or, I mean, use those uh, definitions sometimes. Uh, my political work of like uh, trying to use that as a soft uh, tool 
you know, to put them in a soft way rather than just going to court and trying to address some, for instance, uh, cybersecurity national strategy because some sometimes those are more really like declarative or political efforts rather than just a legal a binding one. Uh, we have another question again from Mariana. Mariana, Mariana. Uh, and she says that the issues uh, about different countries with their own national policies, etc. I've seen evidence studios where some states are actually censoring and posing restrictions on internet use. What will be the best approach ensuring that the rights of individuals are protected in some countries or situations? Have there uh, been any success stories towards agendas? Uh, if we're speaking about the best approach, that's very like a situational concept. I mean, it depends on the particular context of the country. It depends whether in the region that in which we are, you will have some like human rights bodies, for instance, or binding treaties. So it will depend on the strength of the society or the private sector. You can always be allied with them, or even some other political sectors within government or opposition parties. Uh, so uh, of best approach, I think it's very hard. I mean, you, we don't have a silver bullet in order to go and say, okay, this will end censorship in your country. Sometimes you can have even some uh, sort of technical resistance and use like tools like Tor or, uh, or VPN, and those are addressed in the video. So uh, we have some tools to actually bypass censorship uh, or restriction internet use. On success stories um, on censorship. I mean, we are in a really like not very really happy moments because we have been uh, we have been seeing like the increase of these restric restrictions. Uh, for instance, uh, I mean, in, in in China and other countries, we keep that we see these restrictions have not been softened. I think the only country where I've seen this soften is in, uh, in Iran a bit. I mean, some the use of some tools and also uh, in Turkey, and that's very fun because they were in the middle of this uh, attempt of a coup the tax and even the same government officers were opening channels to communicate with the people so they see that sometimes using the tools that provide the internet uh, is a very powerful tool uh, to realize people even their own allies but a systemic approach in cases of success but uh, and like a, a striking success uh, it has not been seen a lot because this type of practices come from countries where it's very hard to Move into or have a, an active civil society. I don't know if it, uh, um, on this issue or some other dimensions to this answer. Yeah, one of the problems we have is that the uh, debates about cybersecurity are increasingly dominated by the security elements of, of states. And the Navy Division Departments, agencies, where, however, they're structured. Uh, have very little history of engaging with civil society and human rights groups. They tend to see them as optional or negative or trying to challenge what they need to do. So I think our first objective is to is to find a way of engaging directly with those agencies and encouraging them to enter into discussion with the wider community, not just with us as civil society groups, but the wider community. And I think we need to do is say, there is a dimension, every society faces a security problem, the best way of tackling security problems is with engagement of the population, because in the end, democracies can only be defended by the people and agencies acting on behalf of the people. We need to find a way of engaging in that discussion and saying that a cyber security strategy that's effective is going to be one that has a clear public dimension, involves public consultation, public engagement, where civil society groups are able to input the human security dimension to, to the argument. And I should emphasize the people and not the security of institutions. So I, I would say what we there aren't yet good examples because this is an emerging field of um, security incorporating human rights. That's really what the project is is exploring how to do that. I think the best approach is to try and engage directly with the hardest and toughest issue around security and how public participation, democratic accountability are actually tools to strengthen the ability of a state to protect the security of its people.
Uh, another thing that I can add is when you speak about cyber security or security in a technical manner, you see that you have three main, uh, main attributes or states that you want to preserve the information, which is the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of information, the CA trial. And when we're speaking about censorship, you are affecting at the very bottom the availability of information. To frame this in a technical manner, you can say that pro pro like uh, censorship or I mean filtering of web websites is actually affecting the availability of uh, information in in the internet or in the cyberspace, and this also leads to other technical consequences. For instance, if you're blocking phone sites or some IP addresses, you can even collapse or crash some websites or some internet services. In really like technical level, so you can also go up and use those kind of uh, arguments, but always these are like a, a, a systemic issues. So you are not on you. It's not about using one single approach. And I, I also pick the part where I'm saying that this is also democracies are supposed to work with people and you to build trust and to build uh, like movements I and mean, to to get people behind your your cause is very important because you can have the most sophisticated uh technical informed civil society organization but you don't connect with people it will be very hard to leverage support in in these cases and also uh even the the most tough uh, dictator is always keeping an idea of being popular among their own people they know that at some point if they are not popular enough they won't uh, remain in power um adt or Greg, you want to add something to this Great. Is, there, um, is there something you'd like to add? When we use yet, yeah, I'm just checking you. Um, you're still connected, and, and the, you can hear everything. Okay. Um, well, while we're waiting for questions, I experienced some technical problems. Um, sorry about that, everybody. But uh, we're trying to fix it. Um, but in in, in sense of um, of this question, you know, you know, um, what is the best approach? Maybe it's, uh, we need to take a step back and really look at, you know, what do we mean by cyber policy? What is cyber policy? The framing for the series, um, um, because the way we're looking at it, particularly um, when we design the videos, is that obviously cyber policy is, is very broad. Very broad. Um, it's something that, that can cover everything from, say, you know, data ethics to, you know, freedom of fiction, um, and the, the dominant narratives here have generally been about security and human rights, um, and security particularly, which is why cyber security is such a um, big force um, throughout the whole series. You'll, you'll notice this as we, as we release the module. Um, so maybe um, um, uh, Pancho or Andrew, um, you'd like to um, say a few words about, you know, how you see cyber policy and why, you know, human rights defenders should engage in it at all. Um, because um, in terms of this question about, you know, um, states um, restriction on, restrictions on these rights and what the best approach is, what the success is, we really need to know what we're engaging in in the first place. Um, so, uh, and, and that's key for understanding the series anyway. So, um, Andrew, Andrew, would you like to uh, say Andrew, would you like to, uh, to start? Uh, yeah, in terms of what we mean by cyber policy, I think what I would mean by it is any policies that are relevant to the operations of digital communications environments. So a policy for me would impose policies to do specifically with the internet and its networks, but also policies that affect telecommunications and the devices that connect to the internet. So that's the, the range of things that I think are embraced by, by cyber policy. For me, any policy that seeks to promote the interests of everyone in society should be grounded in basic human rights principles, which really means, you know, to bring down even further, to respect for the dignity and worth of every human being. Uh, and essentially societies that flourish and are successful need to be founded on the basic protection of the dignity and worth of every human being. So for me, it's, it's, it's a very simple concept, is that as we develop Specifics in the field of broad digital communications, whether it's devices, whether it's networks, whether it's uh, other kind of channels, that they respect the fundamental worth of individual human beings. And we're looking for, in, in talking about cyber policy or cyber, uh, cyber policy that's favorable to human rights, it's those things that enable 
enable human beings and their communities to flourish in that communications environment. That's what I would say, Pancho. Yeah, I tend to agree with this. It is very important to put people in the center. And second, this is not a new concept or not a recycling of an old concept because sometimes when we speak about cyberspace and cyber issues, it sounds a bit uh, like science fiction like or the 80s or this like very uh, uh, graphics. And actually, when we speak about cyberspace, we speak about uh, there are some like uh, synonymous or I mean, or similar concepts like the ICT of the information space or the di digital. It's uh, like uh, very much we are speaking about the same thing, but not only the internet. Sometimes the internet can lead some very reductionist angle. Uh, this is very important to frame a wider way. For instance, when we speak about cyberspace, we can see this in terms of layers. We have a layer, a physical layer, where we, where we speak about infrastructure, when we speak about access, when we speak about uh, some the, the use of the physical world, like in the spectrum. Uh, then we speak also we have a second layer of uh, this physical infrastructure, about software, about protocols, and then above that we have the most important part, which are the human interactions, the content that circulates over the, the network. And through having this cyberspace approach can be a bit wider and can uh, be better, or I mean, in this case, uh, more suitable to address uh, other issues, some other issues like infrastructure, uh, as Andrew was saying, or also about some like, you know, social impact impacts of the technology also have a broader impact that rather than just one particular technology, which is the internet. The internet is our current reality, but it's just one technology and part of a lot of other uh, enablers in the digital uh, realm that can help us to actually promote or uh, give ourselves in, in, in the digital uh, environment. So uh, I think we can, for the cyber policy, as a broader discussion, and also be very clear that uh, also keep an eye on not overusing the word because with especially with public officers I used to work in my government and last week you start adding the cyber prefix to everything and at some point it can sort of lost its sense and you just wanted to talk about technology and it's cyber security, cyber resilience, cyber insurance and cyber cyber cyber. So it's also the need to be careful about not overusing a, a word until the point that it, it lost its it sense. So that's another important part. Uh, so we should um, probably we should move on to other questions. Aditi, you have uh, something to add? I mean, you provoked us with this uh, starting like uh, what about the, this general question? Um, actually, um, Grace said that she has something to add. I'm sort of talking to her in parallel on Skype, so um, if she can't make it on here, she can talk through me. Um, but Grace, can, can you can you mute? Can can you can you speak here now? Okay. All right. We still even have some technical issues with Grace. Um, she's got a uh, quite low connectivity speeds, and so we're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, but um, from that, I know she wanted to make a comment on how cybersecurity was handled uh, generally, generally uh, in 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 terms of cyber policy. Um, but until, um, I'm gonna get a written answer from her, and we can go back to that, and I can um we'll pitch it that way. Um, all right, um, so maybe we can move on to the next question. Um, um, Pancho, if you'd like to have a look. Um, yeah, I think of a question, yeah, from, uh, let me see. There was one about national cybersecurity strategies, Marcelo Blanco. And he said, in Brazil, the national cybersecurity strategy was signed and presented without public consultation. Is there an example of a national cybersecurity strategy with public consultation around the world? If, what was the approach that allowed, that allowed people to participate in this secretive theme? Okay, so I will start from the end. I mean, cybersecurity strategies and policies shouldn't be secret at all. I mean, you can. I was working in the defense, defense sector until last week, and even those policies. 
is is tanky or should be more open because it's about how you will use or leverage uh, the public sector to achieve some objectives that cannot be secretive. So make some of the policy or the layout of your network that can be kept a more reserved way. But national security strategies shouldn't be closed at all. I mean, it's the, the opposite, especially because these cyber security strategies should uh, also impose themselves not only be by their own like uh, normative power or be the, how binding they are, because the time these policies or strategies are not binding at all. Are mostly like a, Lever tools, or like uh, they want to influence the the action of the state or the government, but they, or they have some specific measures, but the actual like a narrative of these policies are not binding. Are mostly about getting influence even inside the government. I mean, you when you develop these tools, it's not only because you want to work with people in the sector; it's also because you want to uniform the cyber policies. So uh, that's first. Second, on public engagement. And some governments that have been uh, have had more public engagement. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, the process I've been following in Colombia. Uh, these processes are not perfect, so probably we will have jumping here somebody from Colombia saying, "Okay, this wasn't perfect," and I know I know let's that. But they try at least to engage civil society and address also their own uh, focus. Cut this first. Uh, Cyber city policy from 2011, and it was very like military and police based. Mm -hmm. And this year they launched a new instrument on cyber security policy. And this time address other concerns uh, from economic sectors and from civil society, and not speaking about like this security as this securitized, totalizing concept, but also, but instead talk about a uh, risk management. And that was very interesting. And they had some workshops, and I think the OAS in America. Again, this is a perfect process, but they have to engage civil society when they go and advise countries to prepare their own cybersecurity strategies. And that's a very good thing. Probably should be more space and there should be more consultations out and after the first draft or before preparing the first draft. Uh, somebody says to me that the government in Brazil just made a very generic document. And again, I mean, uh, there's also the need to identify at which level gover governments are working. When you develop a cybersecurity strategy or policy, probably uh, you you won't be uh, up to the very, the very detail. You, are, you won't be preparing specific policy to one sector. You will be preparing some big uh, broad, broad decisions. But even those big broad declarations should have inputs, influence, and even some deliberation from the other sectors. Uh, in this case, also we are speaking about uh, civil society, but the academy or private sector are very important into this discussion. So that that's a very urgent need. Um, Andrew, you know if you want to add something to this? Yes, yeah, uh, I mean, I think you find it, how many national cyber strategies there are in the world. I think the last I heard was about 90. With more in preparation, so quite a lot of governments do have strategies now, and others are developing them. I think in most cases you'll find they are consulting with the private sector and private sector institutions because these are the companies that actually run the network. Telecoms companies and some of the big service companies almost certainly have been consulted and be may be active partners in developing that strategy. What what very few examples of, and Pancho gave a good one from Colombia, is attempts at broader public engagement as part of drawing up that strategy. I, and uh, when I talk to British, uh, the UK government here about the the lack of public engagement on their strategy, they all said they didn't have any time to do that. They'd spent two years developing the strategy, so I didn't find that a very credible answer. But what I was told privately by some members of the, some officials at high level, we actually didn't know how to go about consulting people on security strategy. That's not something traditionally that these agencies have done. They had none of the traditional mechanisms for engaging with the public. So I think one of the things we should, in our own, whatever our country is, our own societies, if we were designing a public engagement strategy to discuss cybersecurity, what would that look like? 
if we could develop our own ideas about public engagement and public consultation uh, and fit them back into a cyber strategy, that could be something we, we might well find there's a receptive, uh, receptive ear to that. Because at the moment, I think many governments who are consulting on security issues simply don't know how to go about it. So I, I would say there's as much a lack of imagination on government side is, is a lack of will, and that's a gap that we should look to fill, I think, as civil society groups. Yeah, I think there's a gap to fill, and I mean, part of all of this series of webinars, videos, and the whole like uh, project in Global Partners has to do with that. I mean, providing more tools to civil society to be to influence these debates. Uh, Did you have anything to add um, to here? Shifting away, trying to keep in touch with people. Great. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Yeah, I can we can hear you. you. <laughs> Please go ahead. Well, finally, uh, this is so frustrating. Um, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say that when it comes to the issue of cyber security, especially from the um, side of the world, um, it's, it's, becoming, it's looking like a cross-cutting issue that is handled uh, when it comes to regulation, it's just the, the ICT regulator or the Ministry of ICT that wants to handle that. But it's, it's really a security issue, especially when you have uh, gone um, through such issues as, uh, you know, uh, terrorism, as, uh, you know, fraud online. It's treated as, as a cross-cutting uh, uh, issue. And therefore, that has its own challenges because each sector has a different way of how it wants to handle the thing. And so what's, what's also emerging is that different players are coming up with different proposals, sometimes alone, um, sometimes without consulting um, the, the relevant stakeholders. And therefore, you find that you need this working in silos and um, in different pockets of cybersecurity here and there. So the challenge is actually to, you know, recognize that and how um, related to issues that are affecting um, the country. Um, I think it's very, very important to have a public participation process because the issue of cybersecurity is actually going to, is affecting everybody or is going to affect Everybody. So, um, as human rights defenders, I think that, you know that, uh, we need to be more pro. We will need to bring in voices um, to platforms that they don't even want to hear us. But we have an engagement that, for example, because in in places where they don't like uh, civil society participation, um, to come up with strategy is not being antagonistic, one that is seen as inclusive, as being people who care for the rights of others and for the rights of the country. And to also say that actually the issue of security affects everybody. It's not just a state security issue. It does affect humans, and they need to participate in suggesting or in debating on how um, policies um, can be arrived at. Yeah, I, I think it's very important to like uh, at the whole angles and having some specific like uh, positions from from human rights defenders. I think I Grace is uh, very uh, correct about that. I mean, I very, uh, I'm very I do agree a, a lot of with that. Uh, we have uh, another question. It's like, like um, it says the, uh, the following: What is the right to privacy? The general public very often does value human rights that the at the same value as is assigned to others, such as freedom of expression, for example. Do you think this has anything to do with the difficulty to conceptualize privacy? I think this concept can have different meanings depending on the context or on the country. Is really a shared concept of privacy? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, in general, in terms of human rights, especially like the big instruments that we have, Probably uh, one of the like uh, uh, rights that are 
a bit unregulated or has a very specific uh, that its regulation is focusing only one point is privacy uh, and human rights instruments tend to address only the, the parts of the due process of the like uh, arbitrary interference from state uh, in the lives of citizens. As you, uh, as the person that uh, did this question, privacy is a, a multi-dimensional issue. And once the thing, the, the, the thing that happens with privacy, is we have some personal concepts about privacy. We all think privacy in a certain manner, and then we have other angles. So when we speak about privacy, we can we go from the our right to our self-image to our uh, personal autonomy to data protection to privacy in the context of a criminal investigation. Uh, so yeah, there are different dimensions. There are different things. Uh, human rights instruments fall a bit short about that. The, for instance, the UN system has these writers and the reporter in the right to privacy was created just like a couple of years ago. Uh, and there was a long standing tradition of freedom of expression. So even the freedom of expression reporter, for instance, in the American system, He's the one who started, or she, because it was Carol Botero also, uh, Cata Botero, uh, she started speaking about privacy from uh, freedom of expression. So, yeah, I think there's some sort of a deficit in this. And now that uh, with all these mass surveillance or surveillance issues, with that privacy is very much at the stake, that these differences have been translated to like political discussions. And we don't have much in the human rights instruments, so we have to feed them with more content. content. Uh, Grace, Andrew, you have something to add or how you can go deep into this issue? Sure, Sancho. Um, I mean, it's one of those things we could spend hours discussing by itself. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is that within international human rights law, it's very, if you look at what the courts have done, they've always been very reluctant to give a, give a detailed description of privacy. It's something that you kind of know when you have it and when it's taken away, but it's very hard to define it as a positive right. In law, and it's really always been defined in response to either a particular technology or a particular violation. So the earliest examples of cases and laws that relate to privacy, you know, go back several hundred years to, certainly in England, to uh, whether people had the right to come into your home and is your possessions with a proper warrant or a proper due process. Uh, it, it evolved around issues like habeas corpus, you know, the fact that you couldn't just be held with other people knowing you held in custody and what the charges were. That the notion of privacy comes about originally from um, a paper written in Harvard in 1890 by two lawyers, Warren and Brandeis, was based on their photos appearing in newspapers or the photos of one of their families appearing in newspapers and they didn't like this very much. They were wealthy Bostonian family subject to a lot of gossip. So they wrote a paper arguing that people had a right to privacy again, which for them meant not having their photograph in a newspaper without their consent. Although these days, of course, people are photographed all the time without their consent. So privacy has always been slightly nebulous, has always evolved in relation to technology and has to be, it's probably defined not a specific positive law, but by a series of restrictions of, on what people can know about you. So one aspect of privacy is the data that people have about you and how that can be used. That would be called data protection. Another would be an aspect is what are people entitled to surveil you for and under what conditions. Aspect would be what circumstances can someone enter your home or your, your business work, seize information about you, circumstances. So privacy is something that, in a sense, is all a response to a particular experience that people have, rather than something that you can simply say easily, I, I find this as my privacy. I, I think the big change at the moment is that at the moment, people give up a lot of information of themselves to access social media. And because they don't experience directly of any great negative consequences, they just seem targeted ads, so they're bothered about that. There isn't the sort of public concern about privacy that you find among privacy advocates or human rights advocates. And that could easily change 
with an iteration of the Internet, which is when we have the Internet of Things. And either carry devices or wear devices or have devices in our home, which, if you look, are networked and getting information about us, sharing that information. I think in those circumstances, privacy and the security of our data will be one of the main defining human rights issues of the iteration of technology. And one thing that, that strikes me at the moment is the companies that are developing health applications, the Internet of Things, these various technologies, even, you know, driverless cars, which will be collecting vast amounts of data about our journeys, where we go, who we're seeing, etc. None of them are really thinking about the human rights implications of these technologies. It's a big challenge ahead of us to alert people to the dangers of the new round of technological innovation but also work with companies to see if there are models in which people's privacy can be protected at the same time while we can enjoy the benefits that the Internet of Things could bring us. So privacy is those frustrating in, in relation to others that it's very hard to clearly define. If you look at all the international instruments, it was about the violations of the things we have or, or feel are important to us. Privacy is nearly always defined in the negative rather than in the positive. And that, I think, is inevitable because it's really about the sense we have of ourselves as human beings. And it's very hard to fully define in every single circumstance. It's very from time and technology. technology. Yeah. And sometimes I, I like to think on privacy, like, you know, the fish, uh, the last thing they realize that they are uh, in the water. I like that they are in the water when they finally are pulled from the water and they face the and they cannot breathe it. And sometimes with free our privacy, we do have our sense of personal safety, but we don't suffer until we are uh, pulled off uh, this uh, this space, this confidentiality, or this like privacy. And at that point, we can see devastating consequences when they take away our privacy. But sometimes we don't realize that we do have privacy or the level of uh, I mean is that we have until we are taken away of that. And there's this also the issue uh, in the conflict between privacy and security that Andrew was addressing. Uh, I also think that uh, we will see developments on with this Internet of Things, uh, uh, but also with other like modern tendencies, like uh, the smart cities, for instance. There's narratives about uh, smart cities that are addressing like they need to have data on the city and the processes and such, but that implies a bit of uh, taking a, uh, away some of our privacy. But also in the privacy and security field, there was uh, this, this question about, uh, that if we believe this, if there's really a conflict between privacy and public safety, and security agencies often imply this, and there's all this issue, of, for instance, on encryption and Apple versus FBI case, and I would like to just introduce the, or um, start the discussion with that. Is I'd like first to think about privacy and security. Uh, how, how can we maximize both rights and can, how can we uh, make these rights compatible? And a lot, of way in, a lot of ways in which privacy and security are also interesting. Uh, we can see, for instance, how encryption can set our privacy, but also can uh, make us more safe in terms of public safety against criminals. So there's also this uh, like maximizing angle on, on human rights, just like, for instance, privacy and freedom of expression, where we see us opposite rights, but you, we can see also how privacy can maximize our right to freedom of expression, can give us a safe space to develop our ideas. So in these issues, first I would like to, I mean, to frame this in terms of how can we maximize this through privacy. And when we I have... Please, 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 please just something please, before you get into the security. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to emphasize, since um, Andrew has talked a lot about that, I just wanted to emphasize that really private, privacy is fundamental to who we are as human beings and human rights defenders, and, and we make about that every single day. For example, um, uh, we, make, we, we have a right um, to some control over how our personal information is, is collected and used. Uh, but then, uh, um, as human rights defenders, we also 
need to remark that sometimes um, uh, a hard and fast definition people have been questions about uh, about um, the different cultures, um, you know, what are boundaries and what is the content that you can consider private uh, among the different cultures and among the different uh, individuals. And I think as human rights defenders then, it's also to understand our context in the different countries that we operate and just define, you know, what is private, what is con considered private. Um, and then, um, you know, it around that respect of what we consider is privacy to us. Uh, yeah, I think it's very important. And, and again, privacy, and as Andrew and Greg were saying, are very like cultural. I mean, it can be it's molded by our culture also. So the concept that we have of privacy probably is in our culture. That means we have some cultures uh, in some countries that actually value privacy a lot. Most governments in those countries, uh, they just bypass that concept because they think that the governmental like uh, power is more important, and they just bypass any privacy right in order to have their own investigative powers or the power of have their own concept of public safety or security. And probably there's also some angle to work in there. I mean, how you uh, use your same concept of privacy that you use, for instance, in your civil law or in your daily relations. In, in, in your relationship with, the, with government, how do you address some like when the government oversteps in, in, in that right? So that's a, a way to go. Uh, we have also, I mean, Internet of Things was already like very well addressed by Andrew. Uh, and this the problem in one country, I don't have the name of the person, but South Africa, they say that cybersecurity is seen as a danger to society. And they're selling the Internet as a dangerous tool for children. And people can steal your identity and their works. And that plays a difficulty for civil society because they, they are perceived as promoting a very dangerous culture. I think the problem in this is if you frame internet in a dangerous manner, you are just renouncing to get all the benefits from cyberspace or from the internet. A development thing, or all the, the, the educational advancements, the economy, uh, the, even the human rights uh, defense that you can perform using these tools. So addressing cyberspace in a negative manner, I think, is a very, very bad idea in terms of when you want to achieve a country okay. in cyberspace, the level of, of development that you want to achieve. Uh, so I think the framing, I mean, and this is a very sometimes technique that they frame the human rights defender and cybersecurity advocates as from something dangerous. And I think it's all the opposite. How can we enhance our trust and confidence in cyberspace? And sometimes encryption is a very good tool to do that. It's not only a way to conceal a potential terrorism. Mm -hmm. It's also a way to uh, authenticate those people on, in using, for instance, uh, in crypto uh, data signature, for instance. Or also how can we place some confidence over our communications and our interactions? So it's, it's the narrative that we need to counter in terms of framing this as only insecurity. But now we have also to assume that probably there's some uh, level of, uh, I mean, the, the, the people or the, 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 the criminals, the, the terrorists also can use these tools, but this, the, that cannot pass or cannot forbid the rest of the people to them. I mean, uh, you, you still have terrorists also uh, getting, uh, being able, for instance, to uh, buy weapons, for instance. So that, that was a very bad example. But other tools that are used for many things, and that criminals use them, it's not sufficient excuse to forbid people to use those tools in terms of uh, encryption. I don't know if Andrew or Grace, you want to add something onto that? And I think we need to avoid, uh, there are two dangers here. One is utopianism about the internet, that everything's wonderful, there aren't any real problems, government's just making it up. And on the other hand, the sort of dystopian view, which is that the internet is a terrible place full of bad people who do terrible things. The reality is that there are bad people who do terrible things on the internet, and some of them are certainly helped by the anonymity and encryption capacities of the internet. I mean, if, uh, there's certainly strong evidence that child pornography, the trade in child pornography, has been considerably helped by technology and the ability of people to encrypt pictures, change them in closed user groups. 
And I don't think we help our argument by pretending these problems don't exist because we simply won't be taken seriously by the agencies that have to deal with those problems. But as I said, you know, what we don't want to have is a situation where there are those problems and those issues that the positive capacities and the necessary elements of the internet that enable rights defenders to operate in, in closed and repressive societies are shut down because bad people can also use them as well. So I think what we need is a kind of, you know, it's a balanced approach to say there are these problems, but human rights has, has long had uh, the ability to sort of deal with these issues by saying that there are certain circumstances where rights can be restricted. So a criminal, for example, someone planning an act of violence or theft doesn't have the right to privacy. Who wishes to incite violence against a specific group of people doesn't have the right to free expression. These are perfectly acceptable grounds to restrict those rights. And they are entitled and encouraged to restrict the rights of those groups in the interest of the wider public safety. The important thing is to establish a sim where if rights have to be restricted to deal with bad things, that they're done in accordance with an independent legal process based on solid human rights foundations and is subject to appeal to the relevant due process. So it's a question of saying, you know, in the offline world, we figured out how to deal with, with the application of human rights to bad people without restricting rights of, of ordinary citizens and we need to take the same lessons into the online world and again the danger is you know we need to be careful not to be too kind of daring and say uh, these problems don't exist they do but equally we need to reject the dystopianism that says the internet's just a bad place where bad things happen and it's subject to very heavy controls which is the kind of argument we're starting to hear from quite a large number of governments so the question of us being, are they adult, mature, grown up about this, and saying to government, look, we know there's a problem, there are some citizen reasons of dealing with this problem that don't violate the rights of ordinary citizens, so let's, look, let's work together to work out how to deal with these problems. Yeah, Grace, do you want to add something into this? I'm okay with what um, Andrew has just said, but it needs to be done with him on a legal basis. Um, I think also we have seen debates, you know, being in that binary uh, argument that if you don't do this, then this must happen. So, you know, the issues of uh, uh, that we have a security issue, so whatever uh, you communicate might not be termed privacy. And we are seeing a lot of people getting into trouble uh, because of what they post on Facebook, um, which is a space they consider private, uh, a space that they can express themselves freely. But we have seen people being arraigned in court because they said something that is deemed um, as, as, as a security concern. So yeah, there is need to actually do the in the rule of law. Yeah, there was also another question uh, about how privacy and national security. Before you go, go on, before you go oh. on, I just want to add one thing. Um, just, to, just in terms of, um, I got I mean, between privacy and security that a lot of these questions seem to be about and what um, you Grace and Andrew were talking about in terms of you know um, saying if you don't this don't do this bad things will happen the internet being painted as a dangerous place you know cyberspace being painted as a place criminals are where you know there's child abuse but thing what that does is um, you know if you'll see in the videos it's a it's a, it's a we use you know throughout a narrative thread as part of this which is um, one of the main narratives um, that this debate is securitization. Um, what I mean by this is when something is made into a security issue in a way that kind of shuts down debate, brings in, um, sort of legitimizes disproportionate measures where, you know, um, due process that may be there in normal times is uh, done away with due to, um, due to it being an emergency, due to something urgent. Um, so uh, over here, you know, I think it's just talking about privacy versus security here. It's also talking about like all, all rights, especially the, the uh, underpinning democratic rights, right? Um, you look at freedom of expression, privacy, right to access, um, right to assembly association, you know, these are all rights that we need and these are all rights that are being curtailed in the, um, in the name of security, but not in a malicious manner. As, as you said, as Andrew said, you know, these security threats do this. 
but there needs to be a way to show that um, these two things go hand in hand. In the videos, we bring in um, examples like the Af Apple versus FBI debate, where if um, encryption had been um, uncut, that would have actually meant more insecurity for everyone, because um, even though uh, it might make be a short-term gain in terms of security for investigatory purposes. Um, what that really meant is that um, the security is actually undermined for everybody uh, in that backdoor is a backdoor for anyone, right? Whether it's law enforcement or criminals um, who, for whom that data is now vulnerable. Um, and one of the questions was, um, they, I think you were about to go on to Pancho, um, are there any examples to demonstrate how um, these two um, things can go hand in hand, how rights and, and security aren't a, a dichotomy to show that they, they work best together. Yeah, I think we have examples, but first, I mean, I think we have to be very, very careful about what national security means. It's a very old kind of, it hasn't been settled in the security community. Because national security is a changing concept. It comes back from centuries. And the question we need to be asking is, what do we want, do we want to achieve with national security? What, what would, in what way will we will help people? Because since we put national security in terms where we have security, national security against, for instance, personal security in terms, for instance, of use of encryption. So we sometimes we have this conflict on security against security, but how bad can be this national security concept, or how can we are letting? security agencies to have uh, to mold the discussion on cyber uh, on national security that's a very important problem because we need to see what concept of security we'll use in first place as the objective of that i think human rights instruments or a human rights approach can give you can give us a lot of tools to address this concept in a compatible and not uh, uh, not having uh, op opposing uh, human rights and uh, security how can we boost Human rights security. So, national security agencies or police forces, they will always be asking for more powers because they feel their mission is to ensure or protect countries against any threat. So, they will be always uh, asking for less encryption, more ability to surveil and their own goals. But I think in the society, we need to discuss the place of security and how can be this compatible and enhance human rights. So. That's one thing, and we have this concept. I think the use, for instance, the the the, the use of encryption technologies can be seen as compatible with uh, national security if we use that approach. The, the problem is, we if we start with the national security concept that is provided by security agencies, they always we will have the human uh, the triumph card or the uh, the joker in the, in in their maze. And uh, RIT, was saying that this securitization thing is about putting security on top of everything, and this is all. Oh, this is a national security issue, so there won't be further discussion on top of this. And they are starting sometimes from this national security perspective that is already biased. So that's very important to to keep in account. Uh, I don't know if you want to add something, Andrew or Grace or Aditi. I think we have to understand the kind of agencies we're dealing with. So if, if you're a member of a security agency, you get sacked because you've upset the human rights movement. I mean, that's kind of your job. You do get sacked if there's a major terrorist attack on your watch. So if you're an intelligence agency now, you're under a lot of pressure, not because you've got armed soldiers on the streets or you've got a state of emergency. You're under pressure because there are a series of attacks that you haven't been able to pre prevent. So as, as Joseph said, they will always look for the maximum power, maximum authority to cover the maximum risk they would face within their professional agency. So it's part of a democratic process that you balance the influence of these agencies with influence of, of broader broader discussions, civil society, democratic issues, and democratic concerns. Uh, but we need to bear in mind that they would have a lot of situations that have a lot of influence with elected politicians. If you're resident or prime minister of a country, a national security agency comes in, Short Pancho would agree with this, and Grace, you answer them very carefully, whereas if a bunch of rights people come in the room, you might say, oh, yeah, okay, very interesting. You will ha we will carry naturally less influence. Our arguments have to be sharp, they have to be strong, and have to, they have to be comprehensive in the way we bring the broader democratic concerns into the debate. And I think that the key issue is that power without accountability, 
power transparency is dangerous in any society. And, and in a democracy, if you sacrifice everything to security, then you give up what is valuable about living in a democracy and live in a free society. That is the fundamental argument that we need to make. And we need to be pushing that very hard because we will have disadvantages in getting the agencies in front of politicians, but we have the fundamental legitimacy that we're not speaking for ourselves, but we're speaking on behalf of democratic and human rights values, which is what makes us see worth living in in the first place. You want to add something? I, just, just a quick one to say that um, uh, you know the issue, the issue of security is actually being used by by guys to clap down on, on human rights defenders, um, and sometimes it is not um, legitimate. So I think for me, it's for us as human rights defenders to be conscious that uh, the issue of security could be used against us. Just to silence us um, so that we don't express certain things that we are unhappy about um, and to just, you know, just be alert uh, to the fact that uh, in a country, for example, that experiences terrorism, where uh, um, it is seen as a legitimate concern and a lot of people are concerned that something needs to be done, but that is no reason to clamp down on free on defenders. And I think because I don't have hard and fast answers to that, I think this is an issue that we must continue to engage in to think how uh, to deal with. On the one hand, you have, yes, this is a legitimate concern, but on the other hand, that concern cannot be used in you know, blanket form to reach people from certain freedoms that they enjoy or, uh, you know, actually in their constitution. Yeah, what I want to also take from Grace, I mean, she has been suggesting this, not only an uh, issue of privacy sometimes, this national security is also a, an issue of freedom of expression. And it's very important to keep that in mind also as well, uh, because uh, sometimes some types of speech are considered dangerous in some countries or are considered, uh, are considered a threat against national security. And that's a very dangerous part, especially, especially because in matter, uh, human rights instruments on freedom of expression are very clear in terms of what speech can consider or uh, like uh, harmful or can be restricted. So when governments start saying, okay, okay, cannot speak about this because it represents a national security issue, most of the times can be mostly a, a, a matter of how comfortable the government feels with the speech and how they want to treat or this speech using national security as an excuse. And it's very important to debunk this argument uh, when they come, and also to have uh, this uh, development. And also, uh, I want to take that uh, this is a, an ongoing discussion. I mean, we have current threats, we have future, future threats, and countries will keep working that. Uh, so this will be a constant tension. There's not a hard and fast concept as she was working on a silver, silver bullet to address these issues. It's mostly an engagement issue among human rights defenders, but also from human defenders with the other sectors of society trying to get what they are trying to say. Because Andrew was very clear and I, I really shared that view. So sometimes authorities are really concerned that if something happens, for instance, a terrorist attack, uh, the authorities will be the first, or especially security agencies will be the first to be accountable for that. So uh, this other range of interest, national security agencies, they, they now exist uh, to protect uh, as the primary goal a uh, human rights. But we do protect human rights in a demo democratic context, and that's another very important issue. I mean, we want to protect our way of life, in not in American sense, but in the in the sense that we, we live in in community, we have democracies, and we want to protect that. Those values are important. So it's not national security just for the sake of national security. It's national security to address and to protect our way of living, and that includes human rights. Uh, there's another question I want to jump. Uh, this. Yeah, is it, uh, this, uh, there's a question about the uh, offline uh, rights, equal rights online. That's knowing that internet and new dimensions to our life, uh, as we know of life, so how internet is adding new dimensions to, uh, 
that shows our new problems. For instance, these encryption problems are more digital uh, problems. Uh, all school encryption was very easy to to decrypt. And also this can be uh, taken uh, along with uh, how can we ensure online freedom uh, considering the borderless nature of the internet, the global nature. So, um, I don't, I mean, I think first it's true that uh, rights offline equals rights online. There's been two or three declarations from the human, uh, the General Assembly of the uh, United Nations that assess this, especially from, uh, first, uh, from the rights of freedom of expression, but this has been expanded also to privacy. So we, have, we enjoy the same rights online as offline, and that's because humans are universal. I mean, they are not applied only to a subset of issues or context or a certain land or to certain people. Uh, human rights are universal, and we need to take care about uh, I mean, we need to take that and push uh, the boundaries and, uh, and consider uh, the digital realm just as any other possible context in which we will have our human rights. So I think they do apply fully and at their maximum extent. I know if Andrew Grace or Aditi uh, somehow defer or want to add some dimension to this, but I think that this is a question that also involves the answer. I mean, they are uh, applicable to online environment. And like sometimes we see this argument that online environment are, is unregulated, and that's not true. And uh, the online environment, it, it, the regulations uh, are just as applicable, that includes human rights. The only issue that we can address in that matter is sometimes states in the relation with other states in the, or in the cyberspace, they don't have just as clear rules because international law has been, uh, has not had enough development on this issue, but those, that involves the relations among countries. The countries have a responsibility towards people, all people, and uh, it's a universal obligation. Uh, again, Andrew, Aditi, uh, Grace, want to add something? Yes, I mean, I, I firstly think that the principle that the human rights we have online are the same offline is the current, and I'm glad it was established through Frank's report back in 2012. The, the obviously the challenge is how do we realize rights? How do we make that operational when the internet is essentially firstly run by the private sector um, everywhere in the world. The infrastructure and the services are overwhelmingly owned and controlled by the private sector, who are not recognized agents in the traditional human rights sense, which is, is, is states that have responsibilities. And secondly, it's a global network. Most human rights systems where they exist tend to exist and be enforced through national courts. If you have a situation where you have a product that is maybe manufactured in one country, uploaded to the uh, internet in a second country, and consumed by users in a third country, the fictional issues are, I think, as yet unresolved. We don't necessarily know. And, and, and in a sense, practice has, has, has not helped us because in some cases, the uploading country is regarded as having the dominant legal authority. In other cases, the voting country is regarded as having the ultimate authority, and that's that's a debate that's ongoing. So one of the, uh, I think of this as three ways. I think firstly, how do we, in the engineering of the internet, ensure that the technologies that we develop are human rights compliant? So how can we ensure that the, the actual technical structure supports rights? What does that mean? Secondly. How do we ensure that companies who provide the services, whether they're the networks or the, the services themselves, come with basic human rights norms and standards? Thirdly, how do we ensure that where governments have authority or have intergovernmental authority, that that also conforms with human rights standards and norms? I think it's, it's more complicated than it was 50 years ago, where you worried about the human rights situation in your country and you had a clear to sort of figuring out how to protect them. It, it's more common in the internet world. But I, I would say there's an engineering dimension, a commercial dimension, and a policy dimension to reading human rights online. And it's it, that, I think, where we are now. Not so much arguing about the principles, but figuring out how to make it operational in this particular environment. Um, Andrew, 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 Andrew,
Now, I, I just want to say that um, I feel, uh, um, the fact that I, I know a lot of people feel very comfortable uh, communicating behind the screen because they think they can hide or, you know, it gives them some sort of privacy or, or a protection that so that they can commit any crime. But uh, what we are constantly seeing is that uh, governments are coming up with ways that they can actually um, prosecute uh, offenders. Uh, we have seen the, the laws that are actually used for um, offline offenses are now being applied uh, for online offenses. And therefore, uh, I think this is the debate that will continue, uh, although what we need to be conscious of is that uh, uh, governments are also not asleep. They are consistently trying to catch up uh, with, with, with how uh, to uh, prosecute um, on offenders. Uh, on the issue of uh, that some governments argue um, that um, it's not possible to prosecute out of the country, I think lawyers will tell you that uh, there's something called mutual legal assistance where you know, different governments agree or two governments agree uh, for purposes of uh, exchanging information to enhance uh, laws and to you to prosecute uh, criminals. So it's not exactly um, like there's nothing. You just need to know if, for example, that you know wherever you are, whether those two countries have that um, you know mutual legal legal assistance. And then what people need to know also is that um, you know that same the same um, you know when we talk of um, um, human rights, like it is said, your human rights stop where mine begins. Um, I think um, it just users being um, not not being comfortable, too comfortable that not, not be prosecuted because these are going to, to come. But again, as, as people who are involved in this um, sector, I think we also need to be proactive. We need to um, whenever such an issue is highlighted, I think we need to be proactive and start suggesting ways of how uh, we could deal with, um, you know, how to to, to use the offenses or, or, or how to get uh, people aware that uh, some of these offenses can be prosecuted. But again, we do not want to be or regulated. Two laws um, not serve a good purpose. They actually um, end up being a hindrance to people's freedom of expression or association. Yeah, uh, we we'll have to move to uh, like next question. Uh, I mean, on cybercrime, I think the, uh, uh, just one thing I, I want to take. Uh, Grace talk about the uh, mutual uh, legal assistance, uh, assistance treaties. I think we have tools now to cooperate. And sometimes problems are more operational rather than like uh, on principles of human rights or like big international issues. It's more about how can we deal faster, effectively with this request for assistance. How can we uh, keep our levels of accountability of police, but with more efficient manners, or for instance, getting warrants? So these discussions are not mutually exclusive. I mean, we can have more cooperation. We can have uh, we can have human rights, and we can have a global system that can take care of uh, cyber crime. Uh, have also emerging problems. I mean, it's harder to prosecute people when they do commit crimes on using, for instance, or VPNs, and we keep this discussion going, but is assuring that we use our uh, the, the powers of states uh, against people in a necessary, proportionate, and adequate manner, and that's the human rights standards. Uh, okay, there are a number of uh, questions that we have still in this queue. We are running a bit out of time, so um, let me see. I'm looking at the questions. Uh, a lot of cyber crime. Probably we, you will have more chance in the regulatory frameworks uh, uh, to discuss this further. Uh, okay. There was this specific question. I think I will jump to Grace. Uh, some question to say. I would like to know if international law on human rights online is active as as Africa in concern 
oh, I don't completely get the question, but probably I would like to grace how she sees the application of international law of human rights in her space in uh, her own continent or country. I mean, Africa is not only, <laughs> it's not a country, probably we have a bit of diversity, just as in America. In America. I, I, I really don't have fast enough uh, hard answers, but I know there is the Africa Union um, Convention on Cyber Security that can countries, um, I don't know how many right now have actually signed into that but supposed to serve as a guideline within which then each country uh, uses it to, to come up with its own laws, you, you know, in a sense domesticate that. Um, and, and because I think that question was not very clear, I suspect that each country may want to go, will use, yes, the AUC um, convention to come up with guidelines, but I suspect this being Africa, that countries uh, may want to go their own way in that to really have control of these cyber spaces. Um, and because that has not, not happened, again, it's a responsibility for those of us working in human rights to be asked that uh, such laws are not brought to fruition. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, in, in America, I think I mentioned before, the OA is trying to help on developing cyber security strategies and there has been like regional declarations this year in fact we, uh, we prepared one and we're going to address issues of cooperation and having a more uh, an agenda that actually tries to reconcile human rights uh, with security specifically in trying to get together for instance in the American system of human rights we have human rights rapporteurs and we have a cyber security program in the West and we are trying to see how can we make them speak in order to have a common policy to region? But again, this is a on, on, an ongoing uh, effort. Um, the, so this is another question highlighted here that if existing laws or pen codes or countries are enough to prosecute various crimes, those really need to have a cyber crime law. Yeah, I would just remind the wording in the some from these questions, we have like enough laws to prosecute do with cyber laws. I think beginning there's a subset of crimes that uh, go against information systems, for instance, like uh, I know leaking uh, confidential data or uh, hacking into delicate systems, for instance, I mean, uh, critical infrastructure. Probably, yeah, we do need some six cyber crime laws, but I think the question also addresses or implies the what countries are doing with cybercrime laws, that they're also abusing these cybercrime laws to uh, or, uh, restrict speech or to go against human rights defenders or try to address anything as a cybercrime. And I think we need to be very clear that uh, some we need some specific crimes that are really like uh, important situations that are against like big interests, not some kind of speech that can be considered as crime. So there's a balance to to strike uh, on countries uh, in regards to to this. There's another question. Um, I I will just after this go to Andrew and Grace and Aditi and then a uh, final considerations about uh, ways to go move forward. But um, what does this seems is interesting? It's in the chat. What strategies could be used to strengthen disciplinary groups around digital rights uh, topics as, at grassroots level? Uh, I think the best strategy is to start building bridges among communities. We have a strong, for instance, a human rights advocates committee, but sometimes you, uh, you see that those communities are comprised mainly of lawyers. And lawyers, we do know uh, a lot sometimes about technology or how to uh, understand the inner workings of some technology. So you see some advocates, for instance, defending encryption technologies, but they don't really understand what they are all about. And so you see technical communities, and they are comprised mainly of engineers, and sometimes they don't understand the policy side of some issues, or they cannot frame in a manner that can actually impact in the public debate because some communities in the tech world tend to be a bit more close and a bit more focused on developing technology rather than implementing in with a human rights uh, concerned people or affected groups. So it's a lot of room to build these bridges, to have these conversations, but also 
to, to start building common conceptions in regard to that and trying to use civil ballots. I mean, this not that technical discussions are more important than legal discussions. It's how do we integrate and how can this assure and make us uh, our life better. I mean, what we want to achieve at the at the end. It's not about who's more, what is, uh, focus is more important or who ha was more right about issues. It's how can we integrate this. Andrew or Grace or Aditi, if you want to uh, complement or add some dimensions to, to these questions. Yeah, I think of collaboration A as being very necessary, um, particularly international collaboration among civil society groups. I think of it as having three layers. So the the, like a pyramid. So the largest base layer is sharing of information between us so that we understand the different circumstances we're facing, the different environments, the lessons that we're learning from each other all the time. So that information sharing, I think, is the base. The second layer, which is smaller, um, but obviously important, is common messaging. I think out of the information that we share, we stand the kind of arguments and messages that are proving to be effective in the different environments. The more we can have a common message across our international boundaries, the effective it will be. You know, if I can say, look, this is what's going on in Colombia, Brazil, Chile, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, India, Indonesia, etc., then that becomes very powerful with policymakers. They feel there's a trend developing. And at the, the top of the pyramid, which is something that's not going to happen so often, but will happen occasionally, is actual interactive collaboration around a specific goal or a specific campaign. That might be where there's a specific issue occurring internationally where we come together and collaborate, the more effective we are in our global advocacy. So, and that will depend on the issue. I, I don't think it exists all the time, but it feeds off the messaging and information sharing that we're building. So my sense is, think about that as a pyramid. We're building a very large network that's sharing information. On top of that, sharing where we can common messages and ideas and frameworks, and selectively and not too demandingly come together to collaborate around specific actions at specific times. Um, I would say that uh, in this field of... Um... Okay, I think it's very fast. Grace, go ahead. Go right ahead. Yeah, we hear you. I would say that in this field of uh, information, communication, and technology, we have to be seeing a lot of, you know, because because of the nature of the of, of the field, it's dynamic. There are new issues coming in every day. Uh, I think we are going to be seeing a lot of laws being proposed, and uh, we do know that there will be laws that will be aimed at curtailing. Uh, we, we communicate online or the way we, we conduct ourselves online. And so for me, you know, like ordinary people or people we work with, when they hear terms like cybersecurity, internet governance, they think it's a very uh, technical uh, issue. These are issues that do not concern them. So, you know, just like Andrew has said, we will, I think there's, it's very important to work together uh, in, in ways that you can develop and uh, skills um, for people working together. Um, you strengthen their abilities to process information. Um, you know, there are people who are very good in certain things. How you know? How do we harness this good of the of, of the sector? So, that element of strengthening the skills and abilities and working together is going to to still be very, very key. And to participate. Uh, in never these laws are proposed and give input. So that input will not be taken, but the voices need to be there. Um, I, I think even if people don't take them, it will get to a point to get tired and start taking them. Do you have something to add? Yeah, Andrew, well, uh, I think you guys have covered it pretty well. But I think, you know, when, in, when you talk about collaboration and um, working together and getting human rights involved. A key thing here is looking at um, potential allies and who the actors are um, in this space. So, you know, really, um, dominated mostly by government and business, business being one of the key gatekeepers of um, services that we use, 
um, you know, key kind of driver, shaper for the policies that are going to happen. A lot of the time from a purely sort of um, uh, consumer relations point of view. Um, and that has a significant impact for how human rights defenders can, can engage because we can find ways to make their perspectives dovetail with ours, um, with, the, with the sort of um, public interest perspectives that need to be fed in. And then we can, we can make the way because if you think a lot of these, these companies, they're kind of on both sides, where they might be doing censor, censoring themselves, for example, but they are also censored themselves as platforms. So they face the same sort of, um, um, sort of difficult questions, but a lot of the time, uh, some of these decisions are actually being diffused down them. Uh, so, you know, it, I think we have to be strategic about um, how we look at who our um, allies are, and traditionally, I guess, and our sort of ways of engagement. So I'm um, thinking outside the box um, in terms of collaboration and having cross-sector um, uh, discussions and trying to get the shared narrative and definitions that you all were talking about um, for a much broader um, group of people. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much it. It's just that it's a, it's a very broad, broad uh, topic. And as you can see, like, uh, a lot of these questions kind of cross, um, uh, cross over each other and overlap. And I'm sure we'll come over them again and again in each of the other webinars, because um, uh, all these issues will, will uh, in fact, human rights will be a threat throughout the whole series. Um, and hopefully that we can see how piece by piece we can figure out the best way forward, the best strategies um, and, and best practices. Yeah, we will have all the webinars with experts on the more technical side of, of these things. Uh, one thing that I want to add at the end of this part of the multidisciplinary collaboration is let's try to work around specific issues or projects at, at, the, at the beginning because sometimes what I've seen is having a technologist or developing some tools for the sake of developing these tools is not very effective. It's more, issue, it's more useful to actually address some particular issue or demand that we have in our community and try to work or work together around this necessity. Because just doing for the sake of doing, doing it because I need to show my founder that I have a technology, probably it's not the best way uh, to go. Uh, yeah, and just and now because out of time, so we, we have some sort of thing, uh, statement from my side, and then we will go over to Andrew and Anadity. Um, but so I would like to leverage a, a question that works here is like, how would you assess civil society's effort? In engaging governments and the international community in pushing, pushing human rights in cyber policies. I think the whole emergence of cyber policies in terms of um, the, the emergence of cyber security as a very like a need and a, a way to that uh, a new element in this uh, digital policies. I think there's a, a lot to, uh, a big way to go in society. Uh, the, efforts. Uh, I think the efforts uh, that were in place, for instance, from uh, the Global Conference on Cyberspace last year was were very good to introduce and get civil society into this world. Uh, countries are trying to do their best in to write the civil society in their discussions. Civil society also is trying to influence and leverage this. There are some issues where civil society is stronger, like, for instance, I know cybercrime, for instance, we have a civil society that's fighting this loss since a lot of time. But new challenges, for instance, critical infrastructures, uh, Internet of Things, smart cities, um, uh, uh, that we should address and undertake uh, for the remains of this debate in order to integrate the discussions and to be influential, but also understand the political, uh, the political underlying, of, uh, the underlying political discussions around this. This is not a legal issue. We won't solve this, like uh, invoking this legal or human rights, uh, article of the human rights declaration is a bit more complex issue we need to engage and get some political like uh, discussions. And that is a really huge challenge. I would say that even in, in these matters, when we, we speak about human rights, we need to provide them with content, uh, like a solid uh, under, uh, underpinning to be to influence decision makers or to be able to influence cyber policy making as solid arguments and uh, very like uh, compelling arguments because again this is not only 
Azteca legal technical or human rights technical discussions. These are political discussions. That we're, we're discussing how we want to live, what we want to protect. So there's a huge role for civil society, but society also needs to integrate into this debate and understand the ways these things are debated and gain their own space. Because sometimes these forms or venues uh, for discussing these issues, especially when they're coming from security perspectives, uh, are a bit close still for civil society. And there's a space that, uh, for, for one side, the governments and international organizations need to give space uh, to civil society, and even private sector. That is even a bit isolated in some discussions. Also, there's the need to take this ground because when you have political discussions, the political issues, we need also to take your ground and and like use that place to speak. And it's not only that you will be waiting forever that they invite you for to some event. You need we need you need to, to engage with your government, with the internal organizations, with the technical communities, with the companies, uh, in order to get some results. And one thing that we we have the opportunity to discuss in further webinars. I, I hope to leave them as an attendant. Uh, I mean, I'll ask you now. Uh, it's like the whole of private sector. We said some things about intermediary platforms, but I think there's a whole role for, civil, for, for private sector in order how can they help to ensure our, our rights. And this last years, specifically this last year, some companies, probably because of commercial reasons, they are having really strong stance in terms of uh, human rights or specifically on privacy. How can we support them and inform their policies? I think a lot of challenges there that we need to address, and again, one hour and a half are not nearly enough to uh, um, to, to do of these debates. Uh, so, uh, Chris, do you want to post with something and Andrew and then Aditi and then I will say goodbye. Okay. What I want to say is that um, just uh, with this debate we, we actually do realize that uh, we need um, a human rights perspective to the internet and uh, for me uh, we are going to continue as human rights defenders we are to continue um, getting challenges so such challenges um, you know new 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 issues coming up every day for uh, the landscape especially in Africa authoritarian rule uh, that wants to control how so my you know I, I just want to leave with you know this question how how are we going to protect these rights so as human rights defenders we will need to constantly be alert and strategy strategy that can be short-term, medium-term, or long-term, but we must be prepared to confront these challenges. Thanks, uh, and thank you for your participation. Uh, Andrew, you have something to say at the close? Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, I mean, basically, I think Aditi will, will summarize all the material we've had, but I first of all want to thank all the participants, and particularly for sharing your thoughts and questions on the thread, which we picked up all of them at this stage, but we will, and Aditi will, will give a sense of this, we're going to pick up all of these in, in the course of the project. So don't forget if we haven't had a discussion about your issue that it's been been lost or forgotten. And, and the other thing I'd say is that we're beginning a journey here to try and figure out what human rights approach to cybersecurity meet in practical operational terms, not just theoretical terms, but practically. Uh, I think that's something that we'll be doing together over the next couple of years. It's not something, there aren't some experts sitting here who know the answers and know how to do it. It's something that we'll figure out ourselves as we go on. And I'm personally looking forward to working with everybody on the thread and all of the other partners in the project and figuring out exactly how to do this. So I want to thank thank Joe for moderating, thank my colleagues Grace and Aditi for putting this together, and thank all of you for participating. It's, I found it really, really interesting being part of this conversation. Reiterate, um, Andrew's thanks to everybody. You know, it's great to see so many people here um, with all their questions. And Andrew said, um, if you've after I've tried to group your questions and make sure your issue area has been answered today, but there will obviously be a few who which haven't had time to address. But uh, fear not, um, through through the next week there will be many webinars 
to come. Hope to see uh, familiar faces there, new faces there, and um, we'll ensure that your, your questions do get answered, whether here online, by email, or um, within the in-person training. So there's many uh, venues, many um, avenues for, for you to, to speak to experts, to um, be heard. Uh, so uh, thank you for all your questions today. Thank you for, for being here. Grace, Andrew, Pancho, um, a great discussion. Um, I hope to see you all soon for the next one. Uh, the next module is, is up uh, on the website. If you haven't seen it already, it's on cybersecurity um, with, um, with two videos there, so <laughs> a bit less bit of homework for you guys. Um, uh, for that, uh, similarly, you know, send your uh, questions in to me. Um, at gp-digital.org, uh, um, get to the webinar. Um, the webinar will be held next week on Wednesday at 1 UTC, uh, and more information will that will, uh, about that will follow on the GPD tour and um, in, in the, the sort of information um, routes that we have. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, see you next week. All right. yeah. Bye, Bye, you all Bye. for coming. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.